not by power, not by mind, but by my spirit, says the Lord. No matter what is happening around you, the Lord told Abraham, but as for you, you will go to your fathers in peace. For that is the covenant of exemption. No matter what is happening around you, as for you. That's the prophetic code. When you wake up in the morning, just say, well, as I'm going out, no matter what is happening out there, as for me and my house, it's going to be well. Oh, Father, we thank you. Give you all the glory for this wonderful opportunity for us to hear your word. Oh, Father, I pray that you, the Lord, will speak through my vocal cord. You think through my mind that revelation, knowledge flow out of my lips freely to your people. Oh, Lord, I pray, oh God, for heart trans for me and uh, faith to receive for your people. And together, you take us from where we are to where we are supposed to be. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' name, amen. Turn your Bible with me to the book of Psalms 91. Psalm 91, 1 to 14. It says you, he who dwells in the secret place of the Most High, shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. Psalm 91, verse 2. I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress, my God. In Him I will trust. Surely, He shall deliver you from the snare of the fowler and from the perilous pestilence. Not in COVID-19. And he shall cover you with his feathers. And under his wings you shall take refuge. In other words, you are protected. His truth shall be your shield and buckler. You shall not be afraid of the terror by night, nor of the arrow that flies by day, nor of the pestilence that walks in darkness nor of the destruction that lays waste at noonday. You shall not be afraid. A thousand may fall at your side and ten thousand at your right hand. But, that's the prophetic code right there. It shall not come near you. Only with your eyes shall you look and see the reward of the wicked. Because you have made the Lord who is my refuge, even the most high, your dwelling place. The most high is your dwelling place. No evil shall befall you. Nor shall any plague come near your dwelling. That's another covenant of exemption right there. For he shall give his angels charge over you. Don't forget, I told you about two months ago, that is the last, you know, uh, 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 series, uh, 11, that the angels are there to minister to you and to protect you. For he shall give his angels charge over you to keep you in all your ways. You have angelic escort. In their hand they shall bear you up, lest you dash your foot against the stone. You shall tread upon the lion and the cobra, the young lion and the serpent you shall trample underfoot. The Lord will deliver you from dangerous situations. Because he has set his love upon me, therefore I will deliver him, I will set him on high, because he has known my name. 
He shall call upon me, and I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble, and I will deliver him and honor him. The Lord will deliver you from trouble. The Lord will honor you. And with long life, I will satisfy him and show him my salvation. You know, I started a series in April 19, 2020, captioned Tactical Advantage Series. I call it Tactical Advantage because it is redemptive, it is selective, it is based on individual appropriation of the divine provision with its privileges. It is an exposition of Psalm 91, a psalm with antiphonal arrangements, song recited and played alternately by two or more groups. And this psalm is very, very relevant to the time we are in, because he said, you know, I will deliver you in pestilences, I will not allow any plague to come near you. I'll command my angels to keep you. Very, very relevant to the time we are in. And it's full of nuggets of wisdom to navigate us through it. With the peace of God that passes all understanding. The covenant of exemption. That no matter what is happening in our world, we have peace. We have peace. And we have joy, unspeakable, full of glory. So we paused for a period, but the spirit of the series has not stopped. Instead, it has launched us into a realm of inexhaustible supply of grace and glory. Thank God we are in the month of grace and glory. So today, my goal is not to preach anything new, but my goal is to remind us of the truths we have heard as connectors to the ones to come. Because we have paused, you know, for about a month or two, right? It's the principle of pedagogy that you take people from known to unknown, right? To remind you of the truths that we have heard. So everything I'm going to be sharing with you is a summary of the 12 weeks back to back you know, that we did in this series, just to remind you of the ancient truths. Psalm 91 started with a very profound phrase, he that dwelleth. He that dwelleth. Okay, the first thing I said was that the E mentioned here it's not an ordinary E, or it's not an ordinary man, but a special kind of he, a special kind of man. The man who knows the Lord, and the one who has a relationship with him. That is the man God is looking for. If you look into that scripture, you know that that E is not an ordinary E. E that dwelleth in the city place of the Most High. He that has a relationship with the Lord. He is a new created E. A recreated E. Like 2 Corinthians chapter 5 verse 17 says, he that is in Christ Jesus is a new creature. And I just oppose then between the created man and the recreated man in Christ Jesus. Those who have become recreated in Christ Jesus can have fellowship with God and can approach him as people that are sons. To those that receive him, he has given the power to become sons of God. Those who have a relationship with him. You know, there are so many people, they are in church, but they are not in Christ. They are not born again. Out there, they are acting as wolves. But when they come into the gathering of the saints, they act as angels. 
But the man we are talking about here he is uh, a man who has a relationship with God, a cordial relationship with God. And if you are hearing me all around the world, wherever you are hearing me today, if you are yet to have a relationship with God, you are yet to be born again, you are yet to know him, you are still in your sins and your trespasses, the gospel is the good news of Christ to deliver you from your sins. He that sins is of the devil, but because the devil sins from the beginning. But, but for this purpose, the Son of God was manifested to destroy the works of the devil. The reason why Christ came is to deliver you from sin and from the penalty of sin. I made mention of three points which I want to remind you of. Number one, becoming he that is a recreated man is a response to the clarion call and not just a simple wish. Come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and you will have rest for your soul, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. For no one can come unto him except the one that the Father has called. So wherever you are now, God is calling you, come from your sins, come from your way of life, come from your religion, come. He said, come unto me. You're tired of life, you are heavy laden, things around you, you know, are things that you can't understand. People around you cannot even help you. In fact, you are thinking of killing yourself, committing suicide. Jesus Christ said, no, don't do that. Come, and I will give you rest. I will give you rest. You're saying, I, I don't have rest of mind over my life. I don't have rest of mind over my children. He said, come, and I will give you rest. The second point is, God did not call us from religion into religion, but from religion into an eternal relationship, union with God through Jesus Christ. So we have to make a shift from religion to relationship. A relationship, a personal intimate relationship with God that is the fountain of godliness and contentment, which is great gain. We have like 4,300 religions in the world. God is not calling you into religion, but he's calling you into a relationship with him. And the third point is God did not call us for occasional visits, going in and out, but to dwell. He that dwells. The kind of man God is looking for is the man that dwells. And to dwell is to abide, to abide with him. So the Psalms went on to say, the he or man that will enjoy the fullness of God's provision and protection if you look into, you know, the book of Psalm 91, we have the provision of God there. We have the protection of God there. We have the love of God there. And the man that will enjoy all that God has to give is the man that has a, 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 a relationship with him, an intimate relationship with him, and the man who dwells. Because it is possible to be recreated in Christ and not dwell in him. That's another point. Made. It is possible to be recreated in Christ and not dwell in him. I told you of the problem that we have in church today. The first one is that there are so many in the church that are not born again, that are not recreated. But the second problem is also true that most believers today are recreated, but they are not dwelling. They are not dwelling, they are not having an intimate relationship with God. Instead, they go in and out, they rise and fall, and they're living below their redemptive potentials. And I said, the recreated man must be a dwelling man.
to be a fruitful man. The recreated man must be a dwelling man to be a fruitful man. So the question is, what does it mean to dwell? To dwell is to abide. He that dwells. He who dwells. Is one who abides in the word of God. The man who commits himself to a rigorous study of the word of God. Studying, reading the scriptures and making the scriptures the final authority in his life. Take note of that. It's not the man that is just reading the scripture but will not believe anything that is in it. But is a man that reads the scriptures, that reads the scriptures and make the scripture the authority in everything he does. That is the dwelling man. The way we dwell is by reading and studying the word of God and living by everything it says. I made a profound statement that I want to repeat, and that is reading the Bible and reading the devotionals and books written by men are not the same. That when you are with your Bible opened before you, you are in fellowship with God, and nothing compares. Oh, I want to repeat that statement. Reading the Bible and reading the devotionals and books written by men are not the same. When you are with your Bible opened before you, you are in fellowship with the author himself. Nothing compares. So when you're reading the scriptures, the author is there with you. Because all scriptures are written by the inspiration of God. So when you place your Bible before you, know that the Spirit of God is with you to interpret that word and to help you apply that word to your life situation. My assignment in this season as a pastor is to drive you to the ancient word that is ever true. That's my assignment in this season. To drive you to this ancient word that is ever true. The primary duty of a pastor is to point the people's attention to the scriptures and not himself. That is the primary duty of a pastor. To educate the people about the significance of the Bible. That the Bible is not an ordinary book. You know, there are some people, they, they have equated the Bible as an ordinary book. But this book is mysterious. You know that it's mysterious because every time you go back there, you see a new truth. That's the mystery. I've read the Bible through again and again and again. But when we started this back, to the Bible, and I, and I opened, you know, chapter 1, I started, I started reading the Bible looking at the acts of God, and God created, and God said, and God saw, and God made, and God divided, and God formed, and God took, and God blessed. And God ended. And God rested. You know, I was just, I was just you know, enjoying the acts of God and, and trying to appropriate those acts in my life. I've never read the scriptures that way. And I've read it again, and it, that is the mystery. Anytime you go back to this book, you begin to see things that you have never seen before. Any church where the people do not have a high view of the scriptures is a dead church. And my assignment is to help you to know that 
this book is enough. That under the influence of the Spirit of God, this book has the solution to any problem that you will encounter in life. That you come to a point in your life that you exalt this word. That you go to it with reference. You go to it with hope. You go to it with faith. You go to it with boldness. You go to it. We believe in the precious promises that whatever God says in this word is the final say. And it will give you solution. I want everybody under me to exalt this word. And that is why I am leading back to the Bible you back to the Bible. I made a statement that I want to repeat again. Credited to Bob Whitesell. He said, look to the Bible as your leader. Oh, look to the Bible as your counselor. Look to the Bible as the final authority. Look to the Bible as your leader. The Bible is always with you. I am not always with you. The Sunday school teacher is not always with you. In fact, your parents are not always with you. But the Bible is always with you. Rather than giving them your authority, give them God's word. Your church should be known as a place where people look to the Bible and not you for answers. There are places that People look to the pastor, they look to the reverend, they look to the apostle, they look to the pastor, they look to the prophet, they look to the teacher for solution. But I want this church to be a place where you look primarily to the scripture for solution, for answers. It takes the focus off the pastor. For being looked as the solution giver. Because you see the solution in the book. The solution to your marriage is in the book. The solution to your business is in the book. The solution to your career is in the book. The solution to anything you're going to encounter in life is in the book. Go and find it. And I said, if I'm told to leave this church today, I might not have left you with a cathedral, a glamorous sanctuary, a huge bank account, thousands of parishioners, among other human indices of success. But I will regard my time here an eternal success if I can be successful at bringing everyone to the Bible. If I am successful at bringing everyone, the children, the youths, the men, the women, the ministers, if I am successful at bringing everyone to this book, Mm. I consider my time with you as a great success. Because you cannot go wrong if you abide in this book. It is the fountain of messages. It is the seeds of solutions to life situations and the compass from here to our eternal home. That was what Apostle Paul was telling the church at Ephesus in Acts chapter 20, verse 32. He said, I commend you to God and to the word of his grace that is able to build you up and give you a sure inheritance among those that are sanctified. It is time to saturate your spirit with biblical truths. Brother, it is time to saturate your spirit with biblical truths. Sister, it is time to saturate your spirit with biblical truths. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Child, it is time
to saturate your spirit with biblical truth. For from a child, you have known the scriptures that is able to make you wise unto salvation. It is time. You can be singing and not have the word of God inside of you. You can be preaching and not have the word inside of you. You can be ushering and not have the word of God inside of you. You can call yourself a believer and you don't know the scriptures. The Bible says you hear because you don't know the scriptures and the power of God. You will continue to hear. You will continue to go into error if you don't know the scripture and the power of God. And you have to read the whole Bible. Not some selected places in the Bible. You have to read the whole Bible. And I made this golden statement that I want to repeat now. Discipline yourself to study the Bible from Genesis to Revelation. And try to do this many times. Discipline yourself to study the Bible from Genesis to Revelation. And try to do this many times. Discipline yourself. Let me tell you this. It's easier to say, read the Bible. Read the Bible. Read the Bible. It's easier said than done. You can say it and not do it. It's like prayer. You can pray all the time. Let's pray all the time. As Christians, we have to pray. We have to pray. And you don't pray. Discipline yourself. It involves discipline. Why? Because the enemy of your soul will not want you to you know, come you know, to, the, to the realization of the truth that will set you free. So it will prevent you from reading. It will make you justify you're not reading the scriptures. You'll be full of activities without any eternal significance. Discipline yourself to study the Bible from Genesis to Revelation and try to do this many times. Like I said, the wonder of reading the Bible again and again is that you receive fresh insights every time you read. And over time, wow, you begin to think biblically and respond to issues of life biblically. Your being will be full of light. Your ability to discern will be sharpened. You begin to reason biblically. You begin to think biblically. And when you think biblically, you begin to respond biblically. See, there are some of us, when things happen, we just take action without thinking. But this is it. When your being is saturated with the scripture, between you and that action, the scripture will act like a war. Say, for example, this weekend something happened that will have made me very hungry. Very, very hungry. But between that act and my response, the word of God just came to me and God said, my spirit shall not always strive with man. Ah. When, 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 when that scripture came, I said, mm, my spirit, like God, my spirit will not strive. And that was the end. That was the end. If, if, if something happened to you, and between you and that act, there is no scripture that will guide you, then your spirit is not saturated with the word. When you, when you read the word of God again and 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 again, you begin to act the word again and again and again and again. You're not going to be act based on your emotions. You're not going to be acting based on what is happening around you. You take your response from what the word of God says. And you cannot be easily deceived. You cannot be easily deceived. A young lady, you cannot be easily deceived. 
Young man, you cannot be easily seduced. Nobody can talk you out of it. You are in charge. You have the ability to discern. You are whiter than your age. Oh yes, oh yes, oh yes, oh yes, oh yes. Because the word of God has been your meditation. It is a privilege to have access to the complete scriptures. And it is a sacred beauty to read and study the old scriptures. And this is where, you know, truth to the Bible, prophetic drive comes in. We were challenged to go back to the Bible. And by the grace of God, we have responded to the divine call. The same way Noah responded in building the ark. And by the grace of God, you know, we have come, we know how to, through the Bible prophetic drive. We have come up with things that will guide us. You have a copy with you. Don't joke with this. It is life. The first thing said there says Bible reading is an education in itself. Bible reading is an education in itself. If, if, you, if you look into, you know, what, 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 what we wrote here, that by the time you have finished the Bible, you know that it comprised of 66 books, 1,189 chapters, 31,173 verses, 774,446 words, and 3,566,480 letters. That's what you'll have read by the time you finish the Bible. So, reading the Bible is an education in itself. It is impossible to enslave mentally and socially a Bible-reading people. I want to repeat that. It is impossible to enslave mentally or socially a Bible-reading people. I want to repeat that. It is impossible to enslave mentally and socially a Bible-reading people. You know, the reason why many Christians have been manipulated today, they have been enslaved today, is that they don't read the Bible. If you read the Bible yourself, nobody can enslave you. Nobody can manipulate you. Because God gives you wisdom that is greater than your age. If we neglect the habit of Bible reading, we go to church spiritually starved. You know, there are so many people that believe that, you know, when they come to church, you know, they get everything from church. But when you read 1 Corinthians 14, it says, when you gather together, someone will come with a song, someone will come with a psalm, someone will come with, a, you come to the, to the worship with something. Oh God, what have you come with today? You come with a revelation. Because in the secret place of the Most High, you have been fed. Truths have been revealed to you. And so you come with something. You don't come to service spiritually starved. You don't come cold and apathetic, like a bicycle to the things of God. You come loaded. You come on fire. And so with a little word, your understanding is sharpened. But today, people come to church deflated. They come to church cold. They come to church full of worries and anxiety. He said, if we neglect the habit of reading the Bible, we go to church spiritually starved. We will look to the church to fill our empty souls. You'll be looking for the word from here to there. Moreover, we will be disappointed because the church cannot fill the void that we create by neglecting the word of God in one or two hours on Sunday morning. Some people want to come, on, you know, all the problems they have created for years and during the week. You know, they want everything, woo! To go in just one to two hours. 
I'll be preaching just only for 45 minutes. And some people, they want all their life's problems to be removed that way. No. When you get into the secret place of, of the Most High, that is divine workshop. That is the place where things happen. You and God, in that, you know, divine workshop, you can come out of that place without deliverance. You cannot come out of that place without healing. You cannot come out of that place without change. Let me, let me end this way. There is a poem written in what was given to us. When you read the Bible through, I suppose I knew the Bible. This person was saying, I suppose I knew the Bible. Reading piecemeal, eat or miss. Now a bit of John or Matthew. Now a snatch of Genesis. You're just picking it here and there. Certain chapter of Isaiah. Doing devotions, you know. Certain Psalms, the 23rd Psalm, the 12th of Romans, first of Proverbs, yet I thought I knew the word. But I found that true reading, thorough reading, was a different thing to do. And the way was unfamiliar when I read the Bible through. You who like to play at the Bible, deep and double here and there, just before you kneel a weary and yawn through a horrid prayer, you who treat the crowns of writings as you treat no other book, you treat your philosophy book higher than the Bible, you treat your, med you know, your medicine book rather than the Bible, you who treat other books greater than the crowns of writings. Just a paragraph disjointed. Just a crude, impatient look. He said, try a worthier procedure. And that is what we are doing in House of Hope now. We're trying a worthier procedure. Try a broad and steady view. You will kneel in very rapture when you read your Bible true. So what is the vision of back to the Bible? To go back to the source of all revealed truth for the personal and corporate discovery of identity and to come into alignment with God's principle for living. And we are approaching it from two sides, reading together and reading alone. Three weeks ago, we've been reading together five chapters of the Bible. It is my preaching that will go less, but we'll continue to read the Bible together. The scripture is a tactical advantage over the systems of the world and the trends of the world. And this prophetic program that started September 6th will continue until we finish the entire Bible. Because back to the Bible for us is not a cliche, but it is an assignment for generational blessings. Back to the Bible for us is not just a cliche, but it is for our total transformation. Generational blessings, organic spiritual growth, Organic spiritual growth and maturity. By the virtue of my profession as an animal scientist, you know, when, when, you, when you want to grow, you know, something organically, you know, you just, you just throw them out there and they continue to graze. You throw an animal on the field and they continue to graze. You know, natural things, they continue to graze. But if you want to grow them synthetically, you put them in a room. And then you're just feeding them and they are blowing up. They are blowing up. They are blowing up. But the ones that are grazing naturally, you don't see them blow up like that. There are so many Christians, they are just blowing up. 
blowing up. They don't know anything. They are just eating processed meal. But when, when you allow God to grow you organically, you, you don't blow up, but you are solid. Your immune system is strong. This is time for you to grow your spirit organically. And as a shepherd, I'm with you in the process. As we grace organically from the book, healing is there for you. Deliverance is there for you. Power is there for you. Solution is there for you. Oh, hallelujah. You'll be healed of depression. You'll be healed of the pride of man. Hallelujah. Why? Because the pride of man can be a snare to you. You look unto God for everything. You have accurate discernment. There's going to be a massive harvest because God is preparing us for harvest to come. And we're going to be living supernaturally. I welcome you to this journey. It is a lifetime journey. I welcome you to this journey. Don't take it lightly. Don't take it lightly. For example, this, this is telling you about everything in Genesis. Study it. Go to the Word. Pray the Word. Confess the Word. For example, every time I read, since we started, I have this, you know, index card, and I write out scriptures. For example, it is Genesis 1 to 3. 1, 1 to 3. If I go to the bank now, I just take this with me, you know, when I'm waiting in the beginning. God created the heavens and the earth, and the earth was without form and void, and darkness was on the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the water. Then God said, let there be light, and there was light. Let there be light, and there was light. Then God said, all right, let, let us make man in our image, according to our likeness. Okay, let them have dominion, all right, over the fish of the sea. For example, I said God, God's acts, God created, God said, God saw, God divided, God made, God blessed, God ended, God rested, God formed, God called. And the Lord God formed man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostril the bread of life. And man became a living. Instead of you hearing jargons, feeding your spirit. See, there is, there is something about copying the word of God and writing the word of God yourself. There is something it does to your spirit. And that was why God told Solomon, he said, write from the Torah. Write your own portion as a king. He said, if you do that, you are not going to multiply wise. If you do that, you are not going to multiply gold. If you do that, you are not going to... All that God said he should not do, he did. Because he did not copy from the law of God. There is something about writing the scriptures out. There is something it does to your spirit. I welcome you, Johnny. And as I pray right now, if you have not given Jesus Christ a place in your heart, you are just a created man. You have not become recreated. All right? You, are, you know you are not born again. You can, you can receive that life today. Okay? For, for your sake, he came. For your sake, he lived. For your sake, he suffered. For your sake, he died. For your sake, he rose. He rose to justify you. All right? I know that the enemy has, 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 has changed you. The enemy has, has, has possessed you with the spirit of guilt. But Jesus Christ has come to deliver you, to justify you, to acquit you from, you know, from, from, from your sins. If you want to do that right now, wherever you are, just say, Jesus, I come unto you. I come unto you with no righteousness of my home. I come and I say that you are my Lord. I want you to be my Lord from today. Come into my life. Change me from inside out. Change me. Change me. Change me. That is the word I'm hearing in my spirit right now. Change me. Change me. Change me. Give me a new nature. Give me a new hope. Give me a new name. And from today, I declare you are my Lord. I will not live my life the way I please it anymore. I will live my life to please you as a recreated man in Christ Jesus. That is the gospel. And that is what you have received. Father, I thank you. I give you praise, oh God, for 
this opportunity I have to declare your word. And I pray that in the name of the Lord Jesus, as many as have called upon your name to be saved, I declare that a new nature be given unto them. That, you know, the spirit of life in Christ Jesus will come into them in the name of the Lord Jesus and make them new and make them whole in the name of Jesus. And not only that, that from now, they begin to dwell in the Word. They begin to read the Word. They begin to meditate the Word. As we go in this journey together, the Lord, we will extol your Word. We will magnify your Word and make it honorable. Lord, that under the influence of your Spirit as we read, we begin to exchange our nature for your nature. That as we read, we begin to get into covenant relationship with you. That as we read, we begin to grow organically as we read. We begin to live supernaturally as we read. Our discernment shall be sharpened. As we read, we will be transformed from glory to glory to glory by the Spirit of the Lord. That as we read, our broken heart shall be mended. That as we read, we shall be delivered from the captivity of the enemy. That as we read, our eyes shall be enlightened. That as we read, our souls shall be converted. That as we read, we will experience joy in our hearts. Hallelujah, for the Lord of God is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. And we begin to experience wisdom from heaven above. The statues of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. That we begin to enjoy supernatural joy from the depth of our being, the commandment of the Lord arise, enlightening the eyes, that our eyes shall be enlightened to see that the judgments of the Lord are filled and they endure forever. And we shall be changed to the same likeness of the Son of God. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' name, amen. And amen. And amen. Wow. And amen. And amen. And amen. To God be the glory for the word. The word that you have heard today. I want you to hear it again and again and again and again. Until you get the spirit of that word. Ancient word, ever true, saving me and saving you. Hallelujah. Saving me and changing you. We have come. We have come with open hearts. Oh, let the ancient words impart. Holy Welcome our guests to church today. This is church. 